Good afternoon and welcome to the Media Lab Talks series. I'm Andy Lipman and I'm your interlocutor and host for the day. Um, so, uh, and I have to admit, I am truly intimidated by this circumstance. As, as any of you who know me know, um, I'm not usually intimidated. And what's intimidating me is that it's, it's, it's uncommon for me to be talking with somebody who knows so much more than I know about almost anything I could say or ask. Now, I spend most of my life talking with people who know more about anything that I could say or ask, but seldom do I admit it. Um, so today, I'm going to freely admit it. But our, our guest is, is Jill Lepore, who's a professor at Harvard and also a staff writer for The New Yorker. And um, I invited Jill because she occupies a unique place in my mind, and I hope yours, and that is to say, she is one of those people who is so skilled at writing, so energetic, so knowledgeable, and so broad in her investigations that it almost wouldn't matter what she was writing about when you got to the first or past the first sentence, you would have to continue to the end, and by the time you were done, you would feel intimately connected with and drawn into the, the topic that she's written about. And she's written about things as diverse as political parties and, and Barbie dolls and Wonder Woman and, and stuff like that. It's a pantheon that in my mind is occupied by people like John McPhee, who, who um, also was a writer for The New Yorker. And, and it didn't matter whether you cared about orange trees and the Indian River in Florida, or tugboats in Mississippi, just the skill of his writing could draw you in. But in this case, what's different here is that the topics are ones that I think are of great interest and importance to all of us. And that is to say, um, the social history and understanding of how we as people interact with each other, learn from each other, develop ideas, communicate those ideas, and in general, learn to become thinking participants in, in modern society. So in keeping with the format of the way we do things for the Media Lab talk series, Jill will present whatever she wants for <laughs> however long she wants on the order of, of half an hour or so. And then I, as uh, sort of like the host, get to ask questions. And when I run out of dumb questions, you guys by then will have thought of brilliant questions to ask, and so we'll engage you. Um, sometime during the next hour or so, uh, the network that we have may start to work again. But in the meantime, we don't. But if it does, then people will start to tune in externally. And some of them I know are sitting around waiting to do so. And so we'll be joined by tweets and questions from those beyond the laboratory. But for the moment, it's a private conversation among us. And so, okay. have at. Great, thanks. Um, well, thanks again for the invitation. It's really fun to be here. I've never been to the Media Lab before. It occupies this very mysterious, glamorous role in my imagination. So, it did not disappoint walking around. It's really fun to be here. And um, when I was asked to come, I, I wasn't entirely sure what would be of interest to you all. One of the things that, I'm, I'm an American historian. I'm chiefly an American political and intellectual historian. Uh, you know, all oh, those interested. I'll really write about anything, the history of anything. Uh, but I'm sort of fascinated. I happen to be married to a computer scientist. But I'm, so I'm sort of fascinated by, in some ways, the principal disavowal or lack of attention to history as uh, in certain technical fields. And, and also, generally, I think, in scientific exploration, there seems to be a presumption that attention to older ideas just hobbles you in thinking innovatively about your own work. Uh, so I'm trying to think about what would be something that I could compel you with <laughs> that actually is of relevance to all the kind of amazing work that goes on in, in this series of labs. And so what I thought I would talk a little bit about here, I'm not going to talk for a whole half an hour, because uh, there's a lot that we could talk about. I, I'm going to talk about a project that I'm working on for a few years that is broadly in the realm of a very small field known as the history of evidence. Uh, I teach a class at the Harvard Law School that's open to law school students and undergraduates and PhD students. So it draws a lot of students who are doing PhDs in, sci in, in scientific uh, fields as well. Uh, where we look at the history of evidence across four realms of knowledge, science, the law, journalism, and history across the last millennium. And we look at the evolution of ideas about 
how you establish what's true and what's not true, what counts as evidence, what are the standards and rules by which evidence is admitted within those realms of knowledge or rejected or excluded within the, in those realms of knowledge, what's the relationship between the rules of evidence in a court of law, say, uh, and scientific method and the rules of evidence in, in, in bench research, for instance. How's, what's, what's the difference between the rules of evidence that historians use when they work in the archives and the rules of evidence that journalists have or the ethical questions that journalists raise about when, when they're interviewing people. The, the, historically, all these uh, kinds of evidence are related to one another and their rules derive from one another, but they are also, you may have noticed, all of those rules and standards of evidence are falling apart <laughs> at the moment. So there's a certain urgency in thinking through these where, where we got the rules that we are now very much at risk of losing. And I think one way that we can do a better job of thinking about evidence and what, how we know what's true and how we talk to one another about how we inquire and investigate and then how we accept the credibility of a conclusion or the plausibility uh, of a contention or the probability of an explanation, we need to be able to talk better and across disciplines about those things. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about that project uh, and just offer up some provocations that come out of that work. They come out of teaching this class, uh, but also my own thinking about the history of evidence. So I just have a totally measly two slides uh, to talk about. But again, just to offer some provocation here. What I want to talk about is uh, what I think of as the evolution of the elemental unit of knowledge across time. And I'll propose for the sake of discussion that the elemental unit of knowledge across the last millennium uh, has changed from the fact to the number to most recently data. And it's not to say that the one replaces the other. We obviously talk about facts, numbers, and data. Often we mean the same thing when we use those terms, but nevertheless, I think they can be pulled apart in meaningful ways. Um, so I'm gonna give you just a brief history of these different notions of a quantity, sort of the, 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 the divisible quantity, the indivisible quantity of evidence, uh, and where these ideas came from and how they change. And I should say, when I talk about this, uh, by these elemental units of knowledge, I mean largely as uh, they are expressed and understood in a civic sphere, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a public society not in the realm of obscure research, but in the realm of a civic sphere. So the fact has its origins in 1215 in a very precise year, not that the word fact didn't exist before that time, but in the year 1215, the Pope abolished trial by ordeal and said you could no longer tell whether someone was guilty or innocent of a crime by sub subjecting that person to an ordeal. Uh, like drowning or burning uh, to see if they survived. That was how you test whether or not someone's guilty or innocent. The, the rationale behind trial by ordeal was there are some things that we cannot know. They're mysteries to us. They can only be known by God. There's a whole realm of knowledge that can only be known by God, and it is to all of us m a mystery. One of those things is the guilt or innocence of most people. That, 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 that mankind shouldn't be judging other men and subjecting them to execution. Only God could make that judgment. Trial by ordeal was supposed to leave the determination of the guilt or innocence of an accused criminal in the hands of God. But the Pope outlawed trial by ordeal in the year 1215 because it was abused and corrupted. And in England, trial by ordeal was replaced with trial by jury. And this was a huge epistemological shift because suddenly your peers were going to decide whether or not you were guilty or innocent. And this is, think about what that means to go from, you know, saying only God can know whether you, should, you know, whether you should be hanged, to 12 year peers can know that. Well, how are they gonna know that? Uh, so there's this beginnings of a whole legal apparatus around uh, the, the gathering and evaluation of facts. A fact is literally something that happened. It just, in an elemental sense, it's like, comes from the word, very same origins as the word feet, like a thing that happened. Uh, so a fact is just a thing that happened that can be established as having having happened. Usually it has to have been witnessed. There can be other forms of evidence. There can be material evidence that established that it happened. Um, but the role of the jury was to decide the facts of the case. And the role of the judge would be to decide the law. But the role of the jury was to decide the facts of the case. So this idea of the fact um, and what uh, intellectual historians call the culture of the fact begins in English law in the 13th century. 
the, 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 the priority of facts is the act of discernment, that work that you do. If you've ever served on a jury, you're trying to discern from the facts the truth of the matter. Did this happen? Did this not happen? Was, is this a fact or is this not a fact? Uh, it requires this active capacity of discernment. And in the judicial context, it requires a community of a conversation. You, you don't decide alone whether something happened. You decide it with a group of people. So that's where the fact comes from in our language and in our practice and as a form of evidence. And uh, by, you know, over the centuries, it, it's diffused across culture. Because all laymen, women not women, but laymen can serve, every layman can serve on a jury and needs to therefore learn what a fact is. So anybody who serves on a jury helps diffuse the idea that a fact is a thing that we can know that it happened because there's evidence. And uh, that notion of a fact diffuses into other realms, uh, into what is called natural history, but we now call science by the 16th century and animates the empiricism of the scientific revolution. We are discerning facts and we have certain rules of evidence. So the very idea that animates the scientific revolution really comes from the law. And a lot of the standards and safeguards, you should test your hypothesis. You need to be able to convince other people. It needs to be verifiable. Though actually a lot of those things come from trial by jury, uh, where we are concerned about the life or death decision that we mere mortals make about other people's lives. Um, so there's this diffusion of the idea of the fact uh, into, the, into the realm of, of what comes to be science and also into the realm of history. By the 18th century, uh, the first quantitative age, people talk about numbers in the way that they used to talk about facts for the first time. Numbers, the, sort of the measurement uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a unit of knowledge that involves simply the measurement of the, the size of a thing, the scale of a thing, the, the sound of a thing, uh, the weight of a thing. This obviously is a crucial unit of measurement for the scientific revolution, but it comes into the civic realm in the 18th century with the rise of kind of democratic theory. So I really date the rise of the number as an elemental unit of knowledge in the civic realm with the US Constitution, which is the first constitution in the history of the world, the first written constitution in any, of any nation in any case, but it also is the first, the United States is the first state to mandate a count. We count the people, it's in the Constitution. The census is a mandated quantitative act. The state itself is formed on the act of quantification. We couldn't have a representative democracy if we could not count the people. Demo democracy depends on demography, on the science of demography. It is an expression in many ways of the glorification of demography and of quantitative scientific research. So there's this sort of new, the kind of culture of the fact is becoming replaced with the culture of numbers by the late 18th century. And there's a lot that you could think about in the 19th century that takes on that same expression. As democracy is extended with the rise of industrialism, the rise of capitalism, all those forms of bookkeeping and measurement and counting that we associate with industrialization uh, and with, with, with capitalism, place the number at, at the very center as the most sort of important way of understanding the world. What can we count? So you have, by the end of the 18th century, the birth of statistics, the birth of statistics, that is, the counting that is done by the state. That's where the word statistics comes from. It's numbers that the state cares about. So there's this, this close relationship between numbers and the power of the state in the civic realm. Data really doesn't, I think, in the sense that I mean to use it now, uh, which is the aggregation of numbers that are, we, for my purposes, I might say, are uh, too large to be counted by people, where the, where the computational work needs to be done uh, by machine. That begins in the 1890s with the, the first adding machines and calculating machines, but I might say that I would write the, the beginning of data as the elemental unit of knowledge with 1952, uh, when the UNIVAC is con calculating the 1950 federal census. It's the first time the census is calculated uh, using a, a general purpose computer, and it accelerates the counting of the census. It's also used in 1952 to predict the outcome of the presidential election. Uh, so there's the, the rise of, of this era of data, I would really date to sort of the post-World War II era. So we have, I, I want to sort of make the argument that these 
elemental units of knowledge are not equivalent to one another. They're different kinds of things. As I've suggested here in this minimalist slide, that facts involve humans engaging in the act of discernment, weighing evidence to establish a thing that happened. Numbers involve measuring, the measuring things that can be identified in the natural world that in, not, in such a way that tends to be involved in some way with the power of the state. And data computational work with numbers is generally involved in a kind of detection of patterns that cannot be done by humans. And so they all, these things have different purposes, I would contend here, at, again, attempting to offer a provocation that facts which come from the, no, which come from the realm of the law, the, the end that is the object of, of working with facts and discerning facts is truth. What happened? Are you guilty? Did you kill her? That, that work, that work of a jury, that act of discernment of material evidence and testimony, confessional evidence, circumstantial evidence, how, whatever rules and safeguards we want to use, we're trying to find out what happened. The end of knowledge is truth in the realm of the fact. In the realm of the number, the end of knowledge, here again, as I've defined it, is power. It tends to be the power of the state. Uh, I can make that claim be, you know, beginning with the founding of representative democracy with the idea that the people exist and that the people can be represented numerically with a ratio. Um, the slave, the three-fifths slave clause that's in the Constitution is also a calculation. Uh, much that is in the U.S. Constitution involves quantification, and it is all about a way that the counting of people can uh, not, I'm not talking about the state grabbing power, I'm talking about the state exercising forms of power that it may have already had, but exercising them here, ideally, in a way that is more fair. That's the hope of use, that's the hope of democracy, right? Like, that is why we have one person, one vote. Like, we believe somehow that that is more fair than other systems of political uh, expressions of power, that numbers offer this opportunity uh, for equality, right? Like, our belief in equality is a mathematical idea. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We talk about equality in this quite meaningful mathematical way in the founding era of American history. But what we are talking about is power. And here I don't necessarily mean, again, the state um, cabining power so much as the people claiming power. Right? It is the power of the people that we, we assume in the era of numbers uh, is being exercised. And that becomes a contest. But that's the promise of that era. And in the, end of, in the era of data, the end of knowledge is prediction which is actually, to my view, a really uh, a, a loss. Um, because predicting what's going to happen in the future seems to me significantly less valuable uh, than truth or democracy. Um, so I, I guess I put that to us as a, as a point for conversation. What is the value of, of, of work that produces knowledge if the knowledge that it produces is prediction? Which could be seen um, as an uncertain kind of knowledge, which could be seen as a kind of knowledge that takes power away from people. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons, I think, to be concerned about if we are living in a realm, at a, in a moment in which the fact has slowly yielded to data as the elemental unit of knowledge, the one that has the greatest authority in our society and in our politics. Uh, that's something, I think, to be, a, to, to be concerned about. So the reason that I offer this all out in this large conceptual framework is I hope to situate what seem to me, you know, sort of more recent moral panics about social media or fake news uh, or polling that as if these are s disparate phenomenon, they're actually all a consequence of, of the era of data. Ha. Huh. <laughs> I have a list of questions. Did I talk for two? I, no, I didn't. No, talk you for didn't two. at okay. all. Um, when you tie things to the modern world of, of fake news and false facts, um, I get the idea of, of tra the transformational impact of changing things from a trial by ordeal, mm -hmm. um, which actually we still practiced in Salem, where I live today, for 300 years after the Magna Carta was signed. But um, to a notion of that's a transformational goal, changing it to facts, but. You're teaching in the law school, and if there's one thing we know about the law school and what lawyers do, it seems to me, is that the job of a lawyer is to make sure that they present exactly the facts that will support their case and suppress all of the facts that won't support their case. And that's very much different from a trial by ordeal, and God, I hope it's better 
But on the other hand, it sure ain't perfect, is it? So I think that's both right and wrong. Okay. Uh, it's right in the sense that, yes, it is the job of an advocate, of a lawyer acting as an advocate, to argue a point of view, right? But that is, that, so that's the right part. The wrong part is that that is in a system of an adversarial battle, right? We have replaced the battle, there's also trial by combat, right, where you just fight yeah. it out. Um, with a battle of facts. Like right. that is actually, it's not that the, the one lawyer s says what she wants to say and then it's over. Right. The other lawyer, you know, the, the defendant says something and, the, and, the, and the, the state makes its argument. So for instance, an example of, I think, how people misperceive that. Did anybody listen to Serial, you know, the podcast? Yes. Okay. So uh, people will say, one of the things that Serial got wrong, um, or The Making of a Murderer, the Netflix documentary series, is that it acted, it, it assumed that journalists could act as advocates the way lawyers do when lawyers are, you know, defending a, 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 someone who's accused of a crime. So let's say you're a criminal, a de, you're, you know, a public defender. You're defending this guy saying, my client did, didn't kill him. Right, and that you're, that's, you're gonna emphasize the evidence that exonerates your client and you're gonna try to explain away the evidence that implicates your client, right? The reason that those two journalistic ventures f fail to meet journalistic ethics is that they have extracted from the courtroom the adversarial nature of the proceeding, right? In a courtroom, you don't just get the defense lawyer to go up and say, you know, exonerate the client. The defense lawyer is in conversation and is cross-examining witnesses right. in conversation with the prosecutor. So that, you, you, you know, I'm not saying, I don't have some positivist, positivistic view of the law. I, I take your point, but I, I do think it's important to remember that there are safeguards in a, in a criminal trial or in a civil trial that are designed to be sure that we do, that there is a, a battle of evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I'm, I don't want to dispute. I'm not, I'm yeah. not trying to be disputed. My, my, but you can be disputed if it's important for people to be disputatious. Yeah, okay, but, but I'm trying to map it into the, into, yeah. the, into the world I live in, which is not, not the courtroom usually, um, unless I get caught speeding or something like that. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that lawyers are doing, yes, you're right that there's an adversarial proceeding, and yes, you're right that the alternative to what one side presents is, is, is presented usually. Um, when it's not suppressed, and, but that might be just an imperfection. But in the public sphere, that's less often the case. And, it's, and as you say, it's, it's just not the case. And so the facts don't stand alone. The facts stand in a context, and the context is the framing. So when you begin your book with, with reference to Franklin, one of our earliest newspaper publishers, um, the thing that I read when I, when I saw that was that Franklin was very much like what today we would call Fox News, which is to say fair and balanced. I'm going to do what the court does and present the facts on both sides. We present, you decide. We've heard that before. Uh, interestingly enough, I have a friend who's a journalist, and he gets the sense, this is not literal, but it's a, it's a paraphrasing of the way he, his experience was, that when he went to journalism school, what he was taught was journalism was about being fair and complete. And his view now is what journalism is supposed to be about is about fair and balanced. And those two things to seem to be different. And you might get away with fair and balanced in the courtroom, but do you think that you get away with it in the public sphere as well? Or do we have an obligation to go and present, and I don't want to go as far as the Walter Lippmann case, but to go and, and present those facts in a context that is also yeah. Fair. Yeah. So in the realm of journalism, just to establish, to put Franklin in a context, yeah. um, for the overwhelming majority of American history, the press was partisan. Oh, There's yeah. only a very brief era in American history where we have had a nonpartisan Since press. It, it's, really, it's really only from you know, the 1920s to the 1980s. Yeah, there's, no, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, Assumption that the press would be nonpartisan. The idea of the press is that it would be partisan. Absolutely. And that, that is, in fact, where our notion of the freedom of the press comes from. So our tolerance for uh, disputation in public comes from our tolerance for uh, f 
uh, f f for what would have been heretical religious beliefs in earlier eras. So political tolerance in the history of our country comes from religious tolerance. And the work of religious tolerance, like if you think about the writing of someone like John Milton, Milton went to see Galileo when Galileo was in jail, right? <laughs> Galileo was in jail for saying that the earth revolved around the sun and not the reverse, and that was heresy. And Milton came away from that meeting newly committed to the idea that there was not an opposition between freedom of thought and truth. Milton, and he wrote a tract about this afterward, he came to believe that, it, that instead of suppressing people that don't believe in the gospel, as it would have been the case in the Church of England or the Church of Rome at the time, uh, or you know, who, who have heretical ideas, who challenge you received re reveal, real religion, that people should be free to express their own ideas about religion and the truth will out, right? It is a notion that, that there would be a battle of opinions and that ultimately in a fair fight, and this is where I'm getting to fair and bell, in a fair fight on a fair field, if truth and falsehood do battle, truth will always win. That is why we have freedom of the press. So when Thomas Jefferson writes kind of, you know, his statement on religious freedom in Virginia, he says, this just basically echoes Milton. Like, if we have truth and error on a fair field and they have a contest, as long as the rules are fair, truth will always win. Which is how scientific research works as well, right? Like, we, as long as like, you, you can publish stuff and it's gonna get struck down because no one can reproduce it, replicate your work, it's going to be left behind, and the, 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 the more compelling explanation will survive. This, it, comes, it does come from the trial by jury, but it, it enters religion, it enters our political realm, and it's the foundation for how we work as a democracy. The, that means, under that way of thinking, a partisan press is just fine, so long as there's plenty of presses around, right? So long as you have, so Benjamin Franklin starts printing and in 1722, he works for the, a newspaper in Boston. He says, oh, newspaper by 1728, and he writes this essay about the freedom of the press in 1731. 18th century, there's just presses in every town. There's a press that likes the governor, a press that doesn't like the governor. They're all four pages long. They all print once a week. You know, this, there was a, an equivalency um, that is, you know, we later in the 20th century, sort of this fairness doctrine that there should, both sides should, should play out. When the press takes on the guise of being nonpartisan, really, and not until the 20th century, then there's a new ethics around that, which is, which is really, really complicated. Um, but it becomes part of the mission of the federal government as it comes to understand itself during the New Deal to ensure that fairness. So, there, you know, with radio, uh, first with radio in, beginning in 1927, um, then with all communications, and up through the Reagan era, there are licenses and there are requirements for broadcasters and radio and television to offer both to accept that their work has to be in the public interest and to offer both sides of a story. That is just a kind of refashioning of the idea, but that's where you get the sort of fair and complete. Um, we live in a very different media fair environment. Fair and balanced. F f the fair and balanced idea now, the idea that a single publication would do all of that, um, is an, is, an, is an awkward idea, historically. Oh, yeah. No, I buy that. I, I actually sort of date that kind of responsibility in the newspapers to Oaks buying the Times, which mm -hmm. was like sort of the 1880s, right? Yeah. But you yeah. still had Pulitzer and Hertz, Hearst. Yeah. Uh, um, and I don't know, when I, I grew up in New York, so New York at the turn of the century, when I grew up in New York, New York had four or five papers, but each one of those papers was four or five papers <laughs> in 1900, right? So there was the World Telegram and Sun. So at the turn of the century in New York, there was the World. That was Pulitzer, I believe, right? There was the Telegram, there was the Sun, there was the Herald, there was the Tribune, you know, the Journal, the American, right. all the ones that when right. I was growing up were paired up. Um, so there were maybe 12 or, or 13 different papers in New York, and clearly one spoke to the Irish, another one spoke to a different political constituency, and, and, and that's probably probably a good thing. When we tried to solve that problem with radio, with the fairness doctrine, mm -hmm. that always ran into trouble, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, in the Reagan era, was eliminated. Right, and, and, right. And because the, the, right, the assumption, the, the, the argument that conservatives made, even as early as the 30s, yeah, was yeah. That, that that doctrine suppresses conservative speech because it's considered outside the realm of the plausible 
two sides, you know, right. it's this like crazy, and, and you know, that was a fair, that was actually a fair critique. But the thing that's interesting about that Oaks era, I think he buys the Times in 1896, just at yeah, that moment, okay. is that it's really influenced by social science. So journalism suddenly wants to professionalize and become a social science. So that's when journalists are like, well, we're going to be objective and we're going to have a lot of numbers in our stories. And they, they, be, they begin to do a lot of quantitative work. And they, you know, the, it's like the Chicago Tribune has this wall of signs that is like, who, what, where, why, when? Facts, 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 facts. Numbers, 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 numbers. Accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. And like, that's the motto in the newsroom, which has just never been the motto before. But right. they're really trying to acquire legitimacy that there's borrowing from the methods of social science, which is itself borrowing from the methods of the natural sciences, right. which is itself borrowing from the law. So there's this kind of weirdly like fourth level derivative version of what's going on in journalism and that they can't really pull it off. Right. The, the thing that, that starts to scare me today is that we're getting better at all of this. Okay, so, so, you know, you make reference to Walter Lippmann worrying about propaganda and the rise of the public relations industry in 1922, and Borston, who was librarian of Congress, right? Um, you know, 40 years later, also worrying about the same thing, and that the emergence of mechanized publication by radio and television and by the press, in Borston's mind, um, caused there to come into existence a thing called the news cycle. And as a result of the cycle needing to be fed, things that weren't news became news. So therefore, someone anticipating the news was something that was news itself, or a press conference became news itself. And so what, what now happens is it's not neither fair nor balanced nor accurate nor complete, but almost synthetic. And the thing that scares me about it reaching the point of that kind of synthesis, which some people think of as celebrity versus heroism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's created, created by the press, is now we're getting good at behavioral stuff. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting good at data and mm -hmm. knowledge and prediction and patterns and applying it in cases. And so, in a sense, we're, we're not only creating information out of numbers, facts, and lies mm -hmm. and damn lies and statistics, but also making predictions about it and figuring out the right way that those predictions can be used to manipulate the most people. I.e., there was some truth to what these people said in the past, that that notion of propaganda and that notion mm -hmm. of public relations, which we've always been relatively immune to, and that is to say when we fall victim to mm -hmm. it, we build up an immunity now, we're getting past the age where the next antibiotic yeah. will help us. Yeah, Is that, so no, that's yeah. absolutely right. But I want to try to that situate that on a longer timeline, okay. which is to say, to kind of go back to my like truth and error battling on a field. Yeah. Like, do we believe that? That truth would always win on a field? Like, that, that's one question, right? Like, that is a weird ideal on which to erect a whole political system and culture. But then when you, uh, when you believe in democracy that the majority should govern, then often, and this is what Lippmann was concerned about, you get to a point, and, and it's just, the franchise expands and, right. and you know, everybody can vote, but what we know things about that we have to make decisions about, policy decisions about, are more and more obscure things. So we have like, the knowledge required to make an informed decision is rising. The number of people who can make who can be part of that decision making is also rising, but their inability, you know, which means that their relative capacity to fully understand these issues is is falling as as a group, right? Not as individuals, but as as a group. So this came to a head in 1925 at the Scopes trial, which Lippmann was fascinated by because the basic premise is, so you know, Tennessee was one of many states that outlawed the teaching of evolution for interesting and much more complicated reasons than you might suppose. Um, but the idea is, if you believe the people can govern and the people have decided that evolution is wrong, then they can say it can't be taught. But then how could anybody evaluate the hypothesis of evolution if it's banned from being taught? But if you believe that the people should be able to say, like you just kind of go back and forth, you just go around in this circle. So if the people get to decide if climate change is real because we believe that the people get to decide because we, we're in a democracy, that, that, that becomes a problem. So that's where Lippmann's concern about the asymmetry of the diffusion of information. So especially where 
even how schools, what schools are allowed to teach, and the same thing's true with climate change science, right, whether there are places where it's not, or the same thing's true with the history of slavery and the civil rights movement. Like, we have state legislatures and school boards of education that make decisions about what our children are allowed to, to hear about, and that's self-government, <laughs> but it's in some tension with the idea that truth and error have to have, have to battle their way out. So you think about these more modern forms of the manipulation of public opinion. Well, there's a lot of manipulation of public opinion in the 1820s as well, but I think we would all agree that it's a lot easier to manipulate public opinion from a technological vantage in 2018 than it was in 1828. There were a lot of things you could do. You could print a lot of pamphlets saying Andrew Jackson is awesome, but not everybody could even read, you know? Like, it's, it's, there's a kind of limit, and it's quite, a, quite expensive to print those pamphlets. Like, you could do a lot to try to convince people that Andrew Jackson was great, and he does, he, he does win, so they must have succeeded. Um, but it's, it's a completely different endeavor in our moment. So the point is, it is not a fair field. <laughs> right, and th there's a notion of, of friction in that. You made the point that it costs, uh, it costs a certain amount of money to print those kinds of pamphlets. Um, in the last election, for example, um, if you wanted to advertise on Facebook and you were the Trump campaign or the Hillary campaign, Facebook would provide a service for you and they'd say, well, give us 10 ads and we'll test those 10 ads and we'll find out where each one of them is effective and, and we'll apply those ads. And the Trump campaign, being relative neophytes at this, kind of said, Okay, sounds good to us. Gave them 10 ads, they would test those ads and use the right ones. Mm -hmm. The Clinton campaign, on the other hand, because they were professionals, said, no, 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 this is the ad we're gonna use, use this ad. And so the result was, was that the lack of friction or cost of printing mm -hmm. that pamphlet allows you to have that degree of freedom to be, be more, more effective. Um, I wanna ask a different question slightly, because you know, um, we think about Facebook here somewhat because it kind of impinges on the ways we think and the kinds of stuff that we do. And you wrote stuff about political parties as, as you know, being malleable and kind of fought over and, uh, you, you know, from the early days, days of, the, of the Constitution. And, I, and I'm beginning to wonder, is it possible that like, um, you know, Umberto Eco came in and gave a talk here a long time ago and, and he, he made the analogy and said, well, you know, the stained glass in church was the television of the 15th century. Mm -hmm. So television is the 20th century, but the stained glass was the TV of the 15th century. Is it kind of remotely possible that parties are the Facebook of the 18th century and that in reality it may be that the Facebook kind of approach to things as an organizing principle can become as powerful as parties have been in the past. That that may be one of the things the technology mm -hmm. does, change mm -hmm. the notion of how we organize. Mm -hmm. I think it is changing the notion that how we organize. I also think it's also completely falling apart. So I'm not as concerned. Which in one? Some way. The parties or the Facebook? Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's important to remember, right, that, that parties are not in the constitutional, they're not constitutional right. themselves. They're also, they were much derided in the 18th century. The idea that people would form associations and object to the sitting government, people were terrified of that idea in the 18th century. What's kind of, you know, historians, political historians who wax patriotic will say this is the genius of the American system, that in the 1790s, people decided they could get together in common and object to the government and that that would be okay. And it kind of almost wasn't okay because in 1798, John Adams' administration passed the Sedition Act and said, no, you can't object to the government, we'll put you in prison. And they put, you know, political, they put printers of opposition newspapers in prison. Jefferson wins the election and he, you know, the, the Sedition Act expires and he says, you know, that every, every election is a contest of of opinion and this is a good thing and we should be happy to have parties and from there on in there are parties and we understand that the two party system is foundational to our political stability but they're not, you know, they had a beginning, they will have an end. Like there, there won't always be parties. Parties have been, have worked very differently but the thing, the thing about parties that is important is that they both organize and legitimize political dissent. And the legitimizing is important, but that doesn't seem especially in jeopardy at the moment, but the organizing of political dissent is important because you can be effective at arguing against people in power if you work 
collaboratively. And parties make that happen. There's also, so there's, there's a whole kind of interesting history to parties, but as opposed to say interest group, party politics is one thing, interest group politics would be another, um, which we see a lot of in the 20th century. We don't really have party politics anymore in the sense that since the early 70s, even arguably a little bit before, we had targeted advertising to American voters um, that was by fairly narrow demographic. I mean, this was kind of the great success of Nixon's 1968 campaign was identifying exactly, okay, so we're gonna get, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna pull those, those white ca ethnic Catholics the from the Democratic strategy. Party in the Southern strategy, you know, or, and then saying, you know, we're gonna by 1978, 1976, and we're gonna give up women. We're gonna give up white women. Let the Democrats have the white women. We wanna go, we wanna make sure we hold on to the white men. We're gonna get all the union, ex union people. You know, like the, the sort of that, that, that is identity politics. Identity politics isn't some, you know, nefarious invention of the left. It's really identity politics is market research you know, which has been driving American politics since the 1930s. It is now a dominant thing. I think that Facebook is a kind of, it's a, it is an, what Facebook and other forms of social media have done is automated that form of political polarization. It was kind of manually created. It was created by hand, by people like in, in the, the, the DNC and the RNC in the 1960s and early 1970s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's on, it's, it's an automated process, which is why it's very difficult to escape, but it is about atomizing the voter. The, the elemental political unit is the individual vote caster. Uh, like we were talking about the user, the user has this different, the user and the voter have this, the user, the voter, and the consumer have this weird identity as a, as a single thing, like, which is about the abdication of family and community and all these uh, forms of association in that real world that, uh, that social media is utterly about the abdication of. Right, okay. Um, but when has ever been a change in communication, there's been a change in the political organizations that have, that have, that have come yeah. about. And, and so I guess, you know, are we now at the threshold of a change in the political organization. I understand that the roots of the idea of identity politics and the roots of the idea of targeted voting are earlier than modern media. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, modern media is a change in scope and scale of such magnitude that I guess what I'm really asking is, is that likely to generate some change in the political structure? Absolutely. And how we do things yeah, going absolutely. forward. Absolutely. I mean, you could say, I think you could pretty well prove, and I did attempt to demonstrate this in an essay once, that, that every change in the party system, that is to say we've always had two parties, but we have had seven party systems where there were different parties involved, where there, it, it, these realigning elections, which create a new party. Every shift to a new party system is associated with a communications revolution. That is a really interesting pattern, and we are absolutely in the middle of both a party realignment and a communications revolution at the moment. So, I, I, just to say that I, I think that's a kind of unquestionable no. proposition, and it's a really interesting and important Remember one. Remember, she said that. But there is, well, yes, yeah. it's un unquestionable. But the, but the, but another way to think about that pattern, right? Which is to say, if you were to map out. Party system change, party realignment, party realignment part, along timeline. You would also have communications revolution. They'd all map, they'd all line up, more or less, which I, I did. I made this chart. <laughs> um, but what you also see is that communications revolutions almost always do the same thing. That is to say, they democratize information. Right. So they take power away from elites. They, they, they dismantle an elite monopoly on knowledge. So that's both liberating and kind of anarchic. And so the question I think that people are asking at the moment is like, well, where, like, does this, do we reach equilibrium again with that? Or like, where do we, where do we, where do we land oh. when, when we come through the other side of this transformation? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, we use the word friction, okay, to, to, to it's a more hip word than democratize these days, right? Mm -hmm. So you say well, they're frictionless. We've removed the friction from our communication systems and utterly consumerized them. And I'm not sure that you don't want to add something back, and I won't call it friction because that's 
a negative connotation, but mm -hmm. I'll call it viscosity. Mm -hmm. Something that's a little bit of a flywheel on, on stuff. You don't want to consumerize everything. You consumerize nuclear weapons, you give the terrorists an advantage. You consumerize media with zero friction, you might give the info terrorists mm -hmm. an advantage. But I, I think the media of today is not just a realignment, as in the case of multiplicity of different party systems, but rather is going to be change in form. Mm -hmm. And as we go forward, the elections that come in the future will be done communicated, campaigned, and, and, and fought in a different way from the way that they were done before. It won't be targeted advertising at all. It'll be a different mechanism, mm -hmm. rather, brought about. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you know, you've associated these changes in political alignments with changes in communications. I have another question, which is a, um, not a leading question. I really don't know, have any insight into the answer at all, but in reading some of what you wrote, and. In, in your book on American history, it seems to me that very often when there is a technical innovation in communications or even otherwise, it's followed by a rise in fundamentalism and mm -hmm. religion. Mm -hmm. And is that a pattern that, that, that is, is, is even really true or just one or two special cases like after the steam engine or mm -hmm. after something else? Yeah. No, I think that is a pattern and I think it's it's important and interesting, but another way to think about it, the, another pattern that maps onto it across the same timeline is utopianism and dystopianism. So if you say you think about the steam engine, the unbearably tiresome technological utopianism of the boosters of the steam engine, like all human suffering was gonna come to an end because we now had the steam engine, is only matched by Wired Magazine of the 1990s when, <laughs> I mean, if you go back and read Wired Magazine in the 1990s, hey, dude, we like reinvented fire here. Like it's the most, it's just contemptuous of everything that has ever happened ever before. It's the most ego-driven celebration of the genius of the entrepreneur slash disruptive innovator. And it's like these people are dismantling the world as we know it, and they're just sitting around congratulating one another. I mean, there's literally a piece that says, not since the invention of fire has man ever been just so kick-ass. Like, it's just, that is, but I wish- I'm so glad I invited you here. <laughs> I just mean to say, like, the, 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 the sort of, like, macho technological utopianism of the kind of woman-hating Silicon Valley world from that era to our era, is there are antecedents to that as well. You, you know, you can look at James Watt or Samuel F. B. Morse. Like, these people are making, like, Morse says when he uses the telegraph, like, there will never be another war because I invented the telegraph. Like, look, I mean, who's ever going to fight when you could have an instant communication? Like, you get in a dispute with another country, you just send them a little message in my code and, like, we'll resolve the dispute. So, thanks, everybody. Like that is, so you have that. And not that the telegraph is an important- the only people to blame for that? I'm, what? The economists also thought if we get everyone to trade together, there'll be another sure. war. So we're but not I'm just the saying, only like, ones. So you get this incredible utopianism, which has an ev itself has an evangelical zeal, right. right? And then there is a reaction to it, often from people who are left behind. So the era of the great utopianism, uh, the sort of technological sublime of the railroad, uh, is really answered by abolitionists who are Christian evangelicals who are like, yeah, this is only going to make us more unequal. What we really need to do is think about ending slavery. Hello, like this is our urgent concern, and your telegraph isn't helping. And so there's, a, there's, which you, you know, that's not a, ri a rise of fundamentalism, but there's a, often a lot of religious fervor associated with uh, technological fantasy that is answered by social social concerns. So the same, you know, we think it to fundamentalism in the, in the, uh, the, the latter part of the 19th century and, and populism, uh, sort of right-wing populism that is a response to people being left behind by the Industrial Revolution. Then they're cr 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 critiquing that revolution as sort of the progress and poverty argument of like a Henry George that discovery after discovery only makes people the rich richer and the poor poorer. Like, what, how is that progress? Like, the, the, the 19th century questioning with the idea of progress is bringing about economic inequality and widening income inequality. It, is a lot of that fuels fundamentalism. I mean, fundamentalists are like, you know what, what we've forgotten is that we are all equal before God. And so we're going back to church. And that, 
I think that has been really left out of the story of American history. That is a really important critique of technological utopianism. It has been a big part of American history. It has fueled the civil rights movement in the 20th century, which is, you know, in many ways, an evangelical revival, a religious, you know, a religious revival movement. So I, I think it's important to think about those patterns, but not to say the new machine is great and the the revival is is not great. They're actually they are in conversation with one another, but I think that the 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 revival is 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 daring the technologists to actually think about what they're doing. Perhaps as long as neither one goes too far. Yeah. Okay. I'll sort of buy that. I'm just nervous about the rise of fundal, some fundamentalism. There's. That seems to balance yeah, the, the, what yeah. we think of as democratization. Right. And yes, the ones who are left out. And um, I think in particular, one of the things that, that sort of troubles me is there's, um, we have this word religion, and the problem with it is it's applied to two things that are orthogonal to each other. And on the one hand, it's applied to a belief in higher being, which is one meaning of one way we use the word religion, but in the other, it's also as a mode of thought, mm -hmm. which is to say based on faith and not on evidence mm -hmm. or, or, or facts. And we use the same word to imply both, but the one that troubles me as a reaction to the worlds of facts mm -hmm. and numbers of data is a return to a style of thought that is now based on, on faith. Mm -hmm. And that's the balancing. It's associated sometimes with fundamentalism, but that I think is one of the concerns that I, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, no, troubling. And I, I share that concern, but I do think the other piece of that, I would add an element to how we think about religion, which is religion has a place for mystery, right? The reign of the fact doesn't really work. There are things that are mysterious, like how you cherish somebody, what you, you know, what grief feels like. There are things that like, I don't actually want neuroscientists to explain to me that I, that there are things in the human experience and in the history of the world whose mysteriousness I quite cherish and I find solace in that. And that, whether that's a secular act or an act of devotion or some the practice of piety, I, I think that is, that is a deep and meaningful way to be in the world. And the idea that we should have contempt, that, that intellectuals ought to have contempt for that, for, for people who cherish the mysterious, uh, that, that, is a, that is a strangeness to me. It's an artifact of mid-20th century liberalism. It's, it, it's among the big problems with mid-20th century American liberalism. So I, I think that's a, we're going too far astray from what we've talked about, but yeah, that, is yeah. a, that, is a big, that is a big conversation. That's good, I love it. I'm a fan of Mr. All right, it's your turn. Um, uh, we're gonna, I believe we're online, so I believe there is an external audience, which may mean that some people have been tweeting in. I want to be disputatious since since you're invited. Okay. Could I, can I just ask people to identify themselves so I don't know so I don't know who anybody is? Um, my name is Anna Hessenbrook. I teach innovation here. I'm a lapsed historian of science. Um, I, I, w I would like to to just dispute the the categories. I love the you know the. Do you want me to go back to those? Thousand, yes, can't please. Do A thousand I, years I can't for, do. for and in three. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, but I would like to maybe say, if you could give us the quotes at the bottom also. The, that was one more. Um, okay. So the end of knowledge is power in all three cases, um, in different ways, right? So now the end of knowledge, who's wielding the, the knowledge? It's corporate knowledge now, right? So the end of corporate knowledge is prediction, which is market power, and it gets more and more pervasive, and so it also gets invasive, which is the unease that you just expressed. In the middle, we have the knowledge of power. Yeah, the state power is power. Taxation don't, doesn't need any change. And on the left, the end of knowledge is who's wielding the power, whether it's the church or the Lord or something, and it's not at all pervasive. It's just trying to command the assent a little bit so the unruly citizens don't you know, do too much damage behaving badly. Um, so, so in all cases, it's, 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 about, it's about power, um, but it's about who's wielding it and just how intense it gets. We're living in a time of incredibly intense wielding of power, <laughs> but now by corporations, no? Mm -hmm. That's my disputation. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm, I want to know if a lapsed historian of science is like a lapsed Catholic. I'm kind of fascinated by that. Um, I, 
I guess I would just begin by saying you're right. Uh, we could, I could have had slides up here that said these things are all about power and made, and made that set of claims. As I try to be careful to say, these are provocations to get us to think conceptually about evidence over time. Um, I guess maybe to defend my conceptualization a bit more, there's another slide that I didn't show you. I have this three hour long lecture that I give about this. So, um, but the, the slide that I didn't show you actually um, relates to this, this previous slide about discernment, measurement, and pattern detection, which is to say, what is the object of these forms of knowledge? And I had another slide that is about what are these forms of knowledge in opposition to, um, which I guess I'm just gonna suggest maybe defends my other conceptualization. Facts, I oppose to mystery. Like, fact is, you should be able to find this out. Like, we are people, we can investigate it, there's evidence, we can know. Mysteries are things we're not supposed to know, like the mystery of immaculate conception, or the mystery of what happens to us after we die. In the medieval church, whatever, the mystery of generation, like we're, um, numbers, in my view, are opposed to secrecy. Um, the, the idea of a democracy, the idea, the fundamental idea of a democracy needs to be public, uh, that the working of the government needs to be publicized, the notion of transparency or what in the 18th century like a Jeremy Bentham and called publicity, right? And the older sense of publicity that um, numbers are opposed to secrecy. You, you, you make available to people, like you figure out, you do the census and then you publish it. You hold, you have a representative lower house of the legislature and then you open the doors. Um, the, the, the reign of the number is opposed to the reign of secrecy and the secrecy of the state. And the reign of data, <laughs> uh, its opposition is privacy. Like what we give up in this reign is, 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 the, is the private. So I, this isn't really an answer to your question, but I'm just trying to find a way to stand by <laughs> my proposition here because I do think there are deeper ways to look at these. Um, and there's also a part of me that as a lapsed cultural historian just rejects the idea that everything is about power because it seems sort of Foucauldian to me and, and I don't buy that anymore. So I just, I think things are about other things than power often, but it comes down to in the kind of Bill Clinton sense what we mean by power. I'm glad that some people get the Bill Clinton joke still. We've got, you have to be holding the box. Yeah, so yeah. the box will be tossed to the That's next person. Microphone. So, in line of that, so I'm, I'm Richard, I'm a second-year PhD candidate in uh, applied mathematics mm -hmm. at MIT. Uh, I have two short questions. The first one is, uh, in line of what the gentleman just mentioned, I want to say that uh, at the end, uh, everything, at the, at the end of knowledge is actually prediction, because even at the height of uh, scientific determinism, um, we, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, predict what the future is going to look like based on uh, the, the derived the physical laws that you know we have we we know everything about every particle you know in this room that you know if uh, this moving in this direction at, with this uh, momentum at this point mm -hmm. and we know exactly what's going to happen you know two seconds later um, so it's a, it's also a form of prediction and what we're seeing with you know machine learning and data science is it's trying to bring some form of uh, determinism you know into uh, the the process of you know predicting say, social, social phenomena. Right. Um, so I wonder what your response to that uh, is. And my second question is, um, you mentioned that, um, that there, every time there's a technological utopianism, there's some fundamentalist uh, movement or some kind of social policy change. So I wonder, in light of uh, you know, the recent scandals by Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, people realize you know, how abusive Facebook and uh, you know, data companies are. So uh, uh, data companies are. So I wonder what you predict the next social movement uh, would be. Um, yeah. 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 Thank you for that. That's great. Um, yeah, I do, I, I, I see your, your point about, about prediction. Uh, and I wanna say about that though, that I think what we don't do a very good job about at is separating out what things we should be predicting and what things are not that useful to predict or maybe harmful to predict. So, um, or maybe bad for certain groups of people for us to be involved in the predicting of. So for instance, if you take the question of criminal law, we still understand that if someone is charged with first degree murder, we're the jury has to deliver the verdict. The jury will still, the verdict meaning the truth, right? The jury will still look at the facts and decide is this person guilty or not guilty. But the judge does the sentencing. That's fairly recent 
in history. Most crimes didn't, had a sentence. Everybody was killed. Like it was, everything was a capital crime, <laughs> or you would be you would be maimed. You know, if you robbed something, you'd you know you'd be branded, and if you killed somebody, you'd be killed, and that was that. There was no separate sentencing phase to a trial. So the jury was the sentencer. There was no separate role for a judge. But since we separated out degrees of uh, of offense, and we engaged in the work of building penitentiaries and having this imprisonment regime. We now have like, you could go to prison for X amount of years and it's a scalable thing, right? It's a quantitative sentence. So, I mean, I guess there could be like how many, whip, how many times you're gonna be lashed with a whip, but it's a scalable thing. So that means the judge has to make a decision about your sentence and how, uh, how long it will be. That's the kind of thing where uh, a lot of people doing data science have suggested that there is good predictive work that could do that, just make that decision for the judge. Because really what that decision should be about uh, is whether another person is likely to reoffend, And that the likelihood that, you know, if, if, if I commit a crime that I will reoffend uh, can be well predicted by a whole bunch of data that is, there, there are data banks that have this information about people like me who have committed crimes like me and increasingly judges are being asked to defer to the algorithm to do the sentencing. Um, I don't think we have had a conversation as a society. The algorithm is, is private, private intellectual property that is unknowable by the public. The judge is paid by me and you. Uh, we pay for the prison that person is going to. How can a private corporation own an algorithm that decides whether or not that person is going to prison and for how long? That seems to me fundamentally unethical and that we are not having, I mean, there, it's not that there haven't been conversations about this. We could decide, you know what, we've inspected, our best minds have inspected the algorithm and this is what we're gonna do from here on out. Because if it's better than all judges or most judges, then maybe we should be doing it. Um, but should we, do we know that? Do you know, like that, that sort of like, I, yes. We tend to believe that stuff that, that is why the whole like data-based, you know, based on data, like it's just, it's a can't phrase, like evidence-based research, like as opposed to what other kind of research? Like it's a, it's a, like even journalism now, like, oh, we should read the 538 because that's data and everything else is just opinion or fact. We, we have a kind of cult, cultural worship of data that the Facebook and Cambridge Analytical scan, just to get to your second part of your question, it hasn't lifted the film from our eyes, right? People are like, oh, well, we were about to vote Mark Zuckerberg to be president just a couple years ago, but now we hate him. Like, it's just like, that is totally kooky and not at all what we should be increasingly concerned about or troubling to inform ourselves about. The bigger question is, what crap you can get away with now by saying you're working with data. I, I think, and what you can impose on other people and even, uh, put a tax bill for by, by saying that. It's, it diminishes all other ways of knowing and realms of knowledge. Uh, and that is a huge crisis. You know, why we can't understand, you might, under, you might know more about the crime I committed by reading a poem than working with this algorithm. Like, we don't think about that as a form of knowledge. Uh, it tends, the, the ways in which this, the reign of data discredits all kinds of realms of knowledge. And, you know, among other things, the experience of women and children and families and the intimate and the sexual and demeans the private as something that can purely just exist for commodification. There's a whole set of assumptions in that world that we just, we should be talking about. I mean, it's not to say there's not amazing, extraordinary research being done that is data-driven or, we're, you know, that falls under the heading of data science, but we, uh, there were a lot of mistakes made when people decided in the 1890s that social science would solve every problem. Um, it was kind of important for other people to say, you know what, social science can't necessarily solve every problem. It's really useful, but it's important to think about when we should use it and when not. Has there ever been a time when we have said that what we're doing doesn't solve every problem? Maybe you need more women scientists. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're working on it. Dave? Oh, hi, David Oran. I'm a research affiliate here at the lab. Um, there may be another difference about data, and I'm curious whether this resonates at all, which is that in the, in the era, shall we say, of facts and truth, there, there was a conceit, possibly true, possibly not, that 
once that's established, it doesn't change. You know, you establish something, and when you go back and look at it later, a historian might decide it, it yeah. got it wrong, but there's a conceit that things become inviolate, they become solid when those, when those things happen. And in, and in the, the, the domain of numbers, people's behavior or future change doesn't go back and change the laws of physics. It doesn't change the measurement and, and what, what you did as science. What seems potentially really different about this data stuff is that as it, the changes, the predictions actually have a feedback cycle that changes the data. Mm -hmm. And it, we may be entering a period where the, the, at least our thought that we have something firm to stand on isn't there anymore. And I'm curious if you think that's actually something to think about or whether, whether you give we didn't me actually have that even before and we just thought we did. Yeah, can you give me a real world example of that? Well, uh, you know, uh, just uh, if you want to take an adversarial uh, thing, people go into Facebook or other things and they, uh, and they, they attempt to change the, the statistics. They, they add data to the system mm -hmm. uh, based on their behavior that changes the predictions of the system. Mm -hmm. And that could either be organized or unorganized. Um, I mean, the end point of that, I, it, you know, I, I don't want to bring science fi fiction into this, but, you know, most people have seen Minority Report, mm -hmm. right? in which case the behavior of people is actually heavily modified by the predictions of the system. Mm -hmm. So you create this feedback that you yeah. may have had yeah. before, but there was a conceit that that... The, those were single-ended systems, right? You finished with the truth, you finished with the trial, it was over, that was the truth, you're over, move on. The, the data, you did the measurement, that's what the science tells you, yeah. you finish, you move on. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be the yeah. case with data and prediction. Yeah, that is a really interesting question. I don't, I don't, sorry, I don't have an answer for that question. I mean, I can think of analog versions of that. Um, we do revisit verdicts all the time. I mean, the Innocence Project takes, you know, DNA that is in and newly examines it and offers, a, you know, asks people to re-examine, we reopen criminal cases, um, for instance. There are, uh, so we have ways of reopening something. And the, the tampering with the evidence that you're suggesting here, I, I would suggest there are analogs to that as well. You can't work in the, archival collections of any person of any importance and not notice how carefully they have whitewashed stuff. It's kind of amazing when you find something you know they didn't mean for it to be in there. I was reading someone's papers recently and I, then I found his wife's memoir and his wife talks about spending three years preparing the papers to give them to, actually to the MIT archives and I'm like, what takes three years? Like you, have to, like you have to bury all the bodies. Like it doesn't take three years. Like if you died tomorrow, like it would take three years to go through your papers and decide what could be seen. Like there, there's a, we, we, we jury rig the evidence all the time in all, kinds of, in all kinds of realms. But there are challenges to that. We have adopted methods that check those things. So if you were gonna write, if you were gonna write a history of, you know, biography of Robert McNamara, uh, you know, the, the Department of Defense during the, the uh, uh, Vietnam War, you wouldn't just use McNamara's papers. <laughs> like that would be, you would know, they've, you know, there's a lot of selection, there's a lot of culling, bingo. you would lose, use a lot of other evidence, you would assemble a world of other interlocutors to uh, forms of corroboration and challenges to his evidence. So we have methods in other, other realms for doing that. With regard to some of this predictive stuff, I'm less worried about the tampering than about the ways that forms of inequality are amplified and exacerbated uh, by predicting from the world in which we live. We're actually trying to build a better world, right? So if we're trying to make predictions based on, am I likely to recommit that murder? Are people, other women my age of my background recommitting murders after committing one? Like, does that, does that the right way to, 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 to judge how long I should be in prison? Uh, that, to me, is an, is an open and very debatable question. So that's where I kind of get back to what, why predict these things? What, what do we want to predict and what do we not want to predict? And I think this is just to go off topic a little bit, but one reason we are so uh, enamored of these forms of prediction is that they are a lot like conspiratorial thinking. Um, 
we live in a world where people have a very hard time detecting patterns. We have a surfeit of information. We, we used to live in a world of information scarcity. Humans have a hard time with a surfeit of information. With a surfeit of information, we want to find patterns. Either we can have a machine find a pattern for us or we'll find a pattern, but most people natively looking at the way the world, like, there seems to be a lot of conspiracies. Like, it, like that, that, that is just the way we will pull together a pattern. Uh, I think that's a counterpart to the conversation about machine learning and prediction. Sort of like a people learning problem. Uh, down there, then, where you're external? Um, hi, um, I'm Agnes. I'm one of Andy's students. Um, I had a question kind of relating to dimensionality and abstractions, kind of maybe building a little bit off David's question. Um, so in the kind of slide that you present, and also I guess when you're talking about how these forms of communication um, kind of revolutionize the way we think about politics or vice versa, it strikes me that what's happening in each case is that the form of knowledge that is represented is being abstracted and simplified from its representation in the real world. So a fact is you know, linked to a physical object. Mm -hmm. Numbers are derived from kind of collections of physical objects. And moreover, this kind of aggregation and simplification of data, it's you know, one of the big problems with algorithmic bias, the kind of murder trial scenario you're talking about, is it's taking thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of facts, and it's turning them into one statistic, which is then used to you know, kind of predict. And I wonder whether that kind of reduction in information and simplification is something you think is reversible, or something you think is happening, A, and then also something you think might be reversible or kind of counterable um, mm -hmm. in the way we think about technology. Do you have a way you, you can imagine countering it if that were desirable? No, <laughs> um, and I'd like to know. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a pretty urgent question, though. I guess I wish we were using our imaginations more to think about that problem, and so because I don't have the answer either. Obviously, I don't have the answer, and there isn't an answer. My job, just, you know, I'm a teacher, is what I do pretty much all day, is to try it, like, here with this tripartite conception, just to say, hey, wait, let's, like, think about these things. What's, you know, why is this different than that, and, what, and where is this taking us? I mean, we spend a lot of time getting machines to do predictions for us, but have we really thought about what we what it means when we do devise an algorithm to do criminal sentencing um, has Congress had a conversation about that have have the Council of Justices had a conversation? like I just don't know that we we we've really relieved ourselves of the burden of having these ethical conversations um, we have something from the outside world Janine Should I go? Oh, I have the box. Um, hi, my name is Amelia. I'm a first year master's of city planning student here. Um, and I wanted to return a little bit to your conversation around um, kind of observation of people's behavior to rein in this data and how it relates to power, whether that's state power or otherwise, and how often in the pro discussion of progress we have people who are often left behind. Um, how all of those conversations can refer back to a concept of the public and public space in particular. Yeah and whether or not you see a kind of prevailing, not necessarily a form, but like a metaphor for form in the public space and how, we, that can, how it can kind of defer to these ideas in a way that um, also is understanding that public space is more and more of a commodified experience and that mm -hmm. yes, we can have all these quantified discussions of what's happening online, but so much of it is also happening in the public sphere outside mm -hmm. the space mm -hmm. and how planners and architects are complicit in this, but at the same time beholden to it by the economic systems that they operate in. So if you have a, an idea moving forward on how public space might try to <laughs> inhabit all these ideas and, and communicate them. Yeah, that too. That, that it, like this question is a, is a kind of great unanswered problem of a, of a question. I think we have s somewhat unknowingly slipped into accepting the metaphor as true that the social media world is the public sphere. Um, the Supreme Court recently ruled as much in a case where uh, I guess the guy was convicted and released and he was a sex offender and his 
part of his condition of release was that he was not allowed to use the internet um, as a convicted sex offender. And he appealed that, sent that element of his sentence saying that, you know, the President of the United States is tweeting, therefore, and all members of, Con there's not a single member of Congress who doesn't tweet, and therefore Twitter is the public sphere, and therefore you're denying me my rights as a citizen to participate in the public sphere by banishing me from Twitter. And the, the court, the, there was a kind of fast, didn't want to read this ruling, the opinions kind of, the oral arguments are great because the justices are like, what is Twitter again? Is that the one with the bird? Or is that the one with the, like, the ghost? Or, like, no, they, they, the justices don't know what the hell anyway. So, but they're like, okay, I guess you must be right. If the president and every member of Congress has one of these, it is now the public square and we cannot deny it to someone who's a sex offender. Uh, it's a really interesting ruling. It's like a free speech ruling. I'm not sure that I'm totally down with that ruling, not about what, sh what this guy should or should not be barred from, but about, I didn't sign on to that, and, and I don't participate in Twitter, and I, does that mean that I've disenfranchised myself? Should I understand that as a form of disenfranchisement? Um, if Twitter starts charging people to you to have an account, then what happens if that's become our new public sphere? So I, 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 I think we have seeded a lot of uh, analytical ground inadvertently on this question to where I just, I mean, I think like in places like this, you guys are having this conversation all the time. When I say there isn't a conversation going on, obviously you guys are having this conversation all the time and like leading this conversation. But I mean, maybe it's just on down the road, we're not <laughs> having that conversation or at my kitchen table, we're not having that conversation or at most kitchen tables, we're not having that conversation. Yeah, um, so I do think that it took a long time to build a public sphere, and it took a long time to democratize the public sphere, and there are a lot of critics who would say uh, it is no longer a democratic public sphere. That, what, you know, what, that, that is some of the argument about the platforming and that the people want to argue for decentralization, that, that the very opposite has happened. And if you look historically at the kind of sort of myth of digital democracy argument, it, it suggests just this, and in fact, predicts just this that, that would happen, that in fact, this public sphere uh, is actually a great narrowing of political conversation um, rather than a broadening uh, of political conversation. Wait, wait, wait. Just to reiterate what you're saying, whether Twitter is the public sphere or not, I think many of us think the internet is the public sphere and is sort of a fundamental right of all of us. So it would be unduly restrictive to restrict somebody from the internet. Don't you think? I, I don't think that the internet is the public sphere, no. I it's don't part think that. of it. Sure, I mean, I, 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 what I, all I was saying was that to see that that has become the public sphere. And I'm sorry, that, okay, I'm, that's, I'm, I don't mean to yeah. the exclusion the of anything that, else. Yeah. But I wouldn't give you a sentence that would say when you can't read the New York Times, I'm not arguing against that court decision. I yeah. think it's an, but I'm just saying it's a, a, a landmark and how, the question was how we think about the public and who's responsible for that thinking. And I was suggesting that there's a kind of, there've been some shifts that maybe have not gotten the attention that they deserve. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, who's got the magic? Oh, Janine, let's let somebody outside come in. Hi there, so I'm Janine. I'm here representing social media. Um, so we have a couple of questions from Twitter and Facebook. I'll start with this one from Suna from Turkey. Um, asking you to speak to uh, what, what happens when data uh, manipulates or destroys the truth. How can we defend our minds and our research against the exaggerated data? Yeah, so I guess where I, one of the reasons I like studying history is I find a lot of solace in the realization that few problems are genuinely new. So this was a big problem in the 1930s with radio. Uh, it's the problem that Orson Welles was trying to call attention to when he did the War of the Worlds broadcast, which was a f fake radio news broadcast of an invasion from Mars. Uh, you know, he say, later said when interviewed about, like, I was trying to alert people that they shouldn't believe everything they hear on the radio because uh, what people had expressed a lot of concern about in the 1930s, which what, what was then called fake news, the term was used in the 1930s, to refer to Nazi shortwave broadcasts. The Nazis had shortwave radio, radios that they were broadcasting all across the United States and Latin America. 
and they would just send false news reports. It'd be like, news break from CBS News, like it would just be false, it'd just fake news about Nazi success in Europe. And it was especially about the number of Americans who supported Germany. And uh, people of discernment were really concerned that Americans had been asked to really trust the radio, especially asked by FDR to trust the radio, who used the radio in much the same way that Trump uses Twitter, as has been commonly observed, to just oh, bypass Congress and the other branches of government and just talk to the American people and get support for a kind of uh, plenipotentiary support for his agenda directly from the people. And that there hadn't been enough done to help people understand that not everything you heard on the radio was the same. Uh, so there are really interesting campaigns waged in the 1930s by the FCC to address that problem. And it wor many, of the, many of those campaigns were extremely successful because they were run by the government and because they were, they were working to help people see this new medium as one that would allow them to, to participate in the work of deliberation that is part of being a good citizen rather than to receive opinions passively from the radio. So one of the programs that NBC Radio devised starting in 1935 was a show called America's Town Meeting of the Air. Uh, it was on every week, it was immensely popular. They would have tape it, they would you know, broadcast it live and then also um, broadcast it taped from a big lecture hall in Columbia University. They'd bring a bunch of policy people to the front, they'd fill the audience and they would have a debate. Uh, like resolve the United States should have universal national health insurance. And then the people would argue for it against the proposition. They'd take questions from the audience. And then in towns, people would have little debates that would be after the debate. And the idea was you should use the radio as a vehicle to ask people to learn about something in order to argue about it better with one another and figure out what they believed, as opposed to do what Nazi propaganda radio did, which is Goebbels at his desk with a button telling people in Germany and Austria how to think. So it takes a lot of care, but it, you know that was a really important innovation. Like if there had been uh, an MIT media lab and Center for Civic Engagement, town, America's town hall meeting of the air would have been the thing they would have invented. I think it's also interesting how people can be fooled by the form. The, the thing that's striking to me about Wells's broadcast was um, broadcast radio was 10 or 11 years old at the time. You know, it's hard for us to think about radio as not existing forever, but broadcast radio, at least in the United States, was not very old. And actually the notion of breaking into a program with breaking news was maybe only about a year or so yeah, old. Yeah, from the Munich crisis. I mean, somebody had to invent breaking news. <laughs> Somebody had to invent the idea of breaking into a program and giving you an instant newscast. And it wasn't, it may have been somewhat common over the year before that, I don't know, but, but in any case, it wasn't a common concept. It was something that, was, that had only recently been invented. And so what Wells was able to do was to exploit your unfamiliarity with that exact style and use of the medium, which is what Wells was a master of throughout his entire career in theater and in radio and in movie making, in fact, that's exactly what he did, was he, he exploited your um, misfamiliarity or unfamiliarity with the medium in order to make his, his points and everything from Chimes at Midnight back. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of his signal thing, but the unfamiliarity with the medium is the thing that I think was what bollocks the people. Mm -hmm. So that's where we have to learn where the form is. Who else have we, have we got? Uh, we've got one up here, and that may bring us to the end. Hi, I'm Saul Tenenbaum. I'm a member of the public. Um, the, um, um, the Pope may have abolished trial by or ordeal, but isn't the sphere of social media, the press, and the public-ish sphere of that, sort of reinventing it for the modern age? I mean, when you said trial by ordeal, my first association was Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, which didn't drown her, but subjected her um, you know, to a case of pneumonia that she wasn't going to survive. Um, and, you know, um, accused her of crimes which 
government officials think she should be locked up for, you know, without a trial, mm -hmm. um, you know, by jury or a judge or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think I'm, hyper, the metaphor is a little bit hyperbolic, but I mm -hmm. think it also has some truth. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious what you think. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I mean, I guess I, I would remove it from the realm of a partisan conversation and say, I do think there's probably something to be said about uh, the experience of, say, um, the trolling, the call-out culture, you know, both from the far left and from the far right, the, 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 the running the gauntlet that is the experience of engaging in public conversation at this moment that is largely responsible for the suppression of political moderation. I mean, you think about who would want, like, you're, you introduce yourself as a member of the public, like, God bless, you know? God bless. Well, thank you. And thank you for coming here. And let's hope we get to explore the past, present, and future again. And thank you for joining us.